webinars are made possible thanks to generous donor support. If you'd like to contribute, please visit our website, autism.org. Before we get started, I'll introduce the speaker. Dr. Giacomo Vivanti is an associate professor in early detection and intervention research program at the AG Drexel Autism Institute. His career as a scientist is driven by a key commitment to understand and address the social learning in young children with autism. These webinars are made possible thanks to generous donor support. If you'd like to contribute, please visit our website at autism.org. And now I will turn this over to Dr. Vivanti. Thank you very much, Denise. Um, it's a tremendous privilege to be able to share some of the research that we're doing at the Drexel Autism Institute. Um, I'm really grateful to the Autism Research Institute for this opportunity. Um, so today, I'm going to focus on some of the complexities that are inherent to establishing an evidence base uh, in the field of autism interventions. Now, before I do that, uh, I wanna first emphasize that all the work that I'm presenting today is teamwork. This is the early detection and intervention program at the AJ Drexel Autism Institute in Philadelphia. Uh, I am the, uh, the uh, program leader uh, for this uh, wonderful team. What we're doing is to design research that is aimed at understanding how we can improve the well being uh, and the outcomes of uh, young children and individuals uh, at all ages who are on the autism spectrum through early detection and early intervention, and how we can do that in a way that is both respectful of the unique. Uh, challenges and opportunities associated with autism and following uh, a rigor rigorously scientific uh, approach. Now, um, let me start by saying that this is a very exciting time uh, for people doing research in intervention and particularly in early intervention. Now, what you're seeing here is the number of peer-reviewed uh, research studies on autism intervention that have been published uh, in the past four decades. And what you can see here is that there is more research on autism early intervention that was published in the past three years than in the previous four decades combined. So this is very important uh, because we need to contextualize our knowledge on interventions and particularly in early intervention in the context of our very rapidly evolving landscape. The knowledge that we had even five years ago was less than half of what we know now, uh, including uh, knowledge from intervention trials uh, and knowledge from different aspects of um, providing supports and services uh, for children on the autism spectrum. So uh, it's not only the quantity of intervention research that has increased, it's also the quality. Uh, what you can see here is a list of early intervention programs that have been uh, implemented and evaluated using a randomized control trial. A randomized control trial is what is considered by most people to be the most rigorous approach to study the effect of an intervention, to document that indeed um, the intervention in question is helpful. Now, despite uh, this uh, increased focus and uh, emphasis and research attention in the field of intervention. 
uh, individuals on the autism spectrum continue to experience barriers to effective service provision. We can characterize those barriers are, as health inequities, and this leads to preventable adverse outcomes, meaning that because of uh, barriers that continue to make it difficult for those on the autism spectrum to receive the services and the interventions that they need, uh, individuals on the autism spectrum continue to experience um, adverse um, physical health experiences and events. Their mental health are not is not as good as that of individuals without an autism diagnosis. There are barriers to community participation, doing the things that other individuals who don't have autism can do and enjoy doing. Barriers to the overall well being, to their quality of life, to their self reliance and self determination. Um, individuals on the autism spectrum continue to have fewer educational opportunities, fewer social opportunities, fewer employment opportunities fewer opportunities for self-realization. So obviously, uh, more research papers on autism intervention doesn't automatically um, turn into an increase in all of these important parameters. Now, just to give you an idea of what I'm talking about uh, when I talk about adverse health outcomes, um, this is a recent research that we did at our institute where we looked at the uh, large data set uh, on health indicators uh, for individuals who are Medicaid beneficiaries. So what we looked at is um, data related to the health of individuals who have autism and are Medicaid beneficiaries, including those who have a diagnosis of autism only and those who have a diagnosis of autism uh, and intellectual disability, uh, as well as individuals with intellectual disabilities and individuals who are Medicaid beneficiaries but do not have a diagnosis of autism or intellectual disability. What we were looking at is the prevalence and incidence of early onset dementia or early onset Alzheimer's. Uh, and what we found, the long story short, is that if you have a diagnosis of autism, whether or not you have an intellectual disability, your chances to have early onset uh, dementia or early, early onset Alzheimer's disease is more than twice compared to those who don't have an autism diagnosis or an intellectual disability diagnosis. And we don't know why, but what we know is that one important uh, component for healthy aging is engagement in cognitive, educational, and social opportunities that comes with um, social experiences and participation in the community. We believe that individuals on the autism spectrum are still not receiving uh, the kind of services that are needed for a healthy um, life in general. Uh, which brings me back to this slide, the two um, uh, young men that you see in the picture are my brothers, Giulio and Michele. They were diagnosed with autism in 1990 in my country, in Italy, where I grew up. Now, back then, um, when you will bring a child to be um, seen by a psychiatrist and the psychiatrist will say, this child is autistic, the basic uh, and the, the prevailing notion in the professional community was that autism was caused by bad parenting. And so when they were, um, when, when they were referred to a psychiatrist, uh, the psychiatrist said these children have autism because their mother is a medical doctor, which indeed my mother was a medical doctor. And that means that she's probably not placing enough um, love or warmth uh, and affection towards their children. So the therapy that we recommend, the intervention that we recommend is for their mother to stay home instead of going to work. Now I tell this story as an example of how if we don't use science as a platform 
to make decisions about interventions, um, then we end up providing or causing even more damage to children with autism and their families. Now, the notion that autism can be caused by bad parenting has been completely discredited. In fact, a long, a long time ago. However, the science that discredited that notion somehow did not make it to the professional communities uh, in that particular context and in that particular age. Uh, this is just one example of how knowledge or scientific knowledge alone uh, is not enough. For that knowledge to be used by professionals and to turn into actual service provision, uh, it's important to understand the implementation um, of research data and how those can turn into services and supports. Now, in the case of my brothers, uh, what happened is that they did not receive interventions or evidence-based interventions, even if those were available. But there are other situations uh, that can complicate the path between the creation of research knowledge in uh, the field of intervention and individuals on the autism spectrum actually receiving interventions that are based on that knowledge. So uh, I'm gonna focus on four um, issues in particular. Now, the first one is the gap between research and practice. What I showed you in the first slide is a lot of new data are available. And those data are about ways that we can use practices that we can use, interventions that we can use that have been shown to be beneficial for uh, individuals on the autism spectrum. Now, what happens though, is that uh, when we see the same interventions or the same practices being implemented in community programs, often what we see is different implementation procedures. Uh, for example, uh, an intervention package that has been shown to be effective includes 10 specific practices. And when that is implemented in the community, only five of those 10 practices are used. So basically what happens is that they're doing 50% of what was originally shown to be evidence-based. Now that might be good for feasibility. It's good that community programs uh, adapt interventions to a certain degree. You cannot expect that you take one intervention the way it's described by a clinical trial and you do the exact same thing uh, in a community program. But it can be detrimental to effectiveness if what gets missed uh, are vital components or active ingredient, ingredients of the intervention. So if you're doing a diluted version of the intervention, then you will have children uh, who are receiving the intervention not responding in the way it was originally designed. So one example uh, where we see differences in uh, community implementation compared to uh, what, we, what has been shown in intervention trial is, uh, comes from this study that I did with my colleagues. And what we looked at is the degree to which outcomes of the early Star Denver model, which is, a, which is an evidence-based intervention um, for young children with autism, uh, the degree to which outcomes of that program were associated with the degree of rigor to which the intervention was actually implemented. So basically we uh, recorded and measured the way the intervention, the early Star Denver model uh, was implemented by uh, the clinicians and therapists who were uh, uh, tasked with doing the intervention. Uh, and what we found uh, is that there were a lot of variation. Certain individuals, certain therapists were actually implementing 100% of the procedures that are stipulated by this program. But some other therapists, they were doing 80%. Some others were doing 50%. Some others were doing 30%. And there was inconsistency across children, meaning that the same therapist might uh, implement uh, 
the, the 100 percent of the procedure so highly rigorous uh, implementation for one child but not with another child and then we measured the response of children to the intervention where they learning language where they learning uh, to um, uh, uh, play where they learning social communication and the cognitive goals and the adaptive goals uh, the safety and uh, hygiene goals that were involved in the intervention, all the things that they were trying to teach. And what we found is that children with better outcomes, the ones who were learning more in response to the intervention, were those whose therapies were implementing the intervention to a higher degree of fidelity. That was most more important than the initial IQ or uh, cognitive impairment or other areas of impairment for the child. And what we found is that each procedure that was involved in the uh, early start Denver model was actually associated with the outcomes, meaning that if you're doing this package, uh, but you only do half of the procedures, you are losing power, you are diluting the intervention. So what, why is it uh, that interventions when they are implemented in the community uh, might be somewhat implemented in a way that is not as at fidelity, meaning as rigorous or not adherent to, uh, um, to the manual. So there are different uh, components here. Uh, an important component is the philosophical commitment within a community program or any program implementing the intervention. Uh, which is associated with the climate, um, the attitudes, the norms, and the self-efficacy of those implementing the intervention. Do they believe that they can uh, competently uh, in, in, implement the intervention? Are they systematically incentivized to do so? Do they believe that their colleagues are implementing the intervention as rigorously um, as they do, and so on? Feasibility is another important uh, factor here because interventions are complex. Um, and so the question that we need to ask if we want interventions to be not only uh, demonstrated to be effective in a clinical trial, but also implemented rigorously in the community so that children can actually benefit from it, is whether programs have the skills, training, and capacity to do what an intervention stipulates. So this is about infrastructure, it's about resources, it's about dollars, it's about training. Uh, it's also important to understand uh, the extent to which the approaches, the intervention uh, approach is implemented with all children versus selectively implemented with some, but not others, for reason which may be logical for the therapist, but not otherwise uh, apparent. So uh, it's what we see in intervention trials are procedures that are supposed to be implemented um, in a flexible way, but in a rigorous way. And we saw these sort of differences in rigor depending on children without a clear rationale for why you will do 100% of the procedures um, for, one in, for one child, but not for another one. Now, how do we improve all of these outcomes? How do we uh, make sure that when I'm using an intervention in a community program, uh, I have the philosophical commitment, the intervention is implemented because it's feasible to do so, and it's implemented in a more standardized way so that no child is giving a, a short version or a diluted version of the intervention. How do we do that? Through community partner participatory research. And this is the kind of collaborative research where those who are um, the, the creating or testing interventions in clinical trials, those are typically academic uh, entities. Um, they don't just publish a paper or a manual and hope that community programs will adopt those interventions, but they actually collaborate with community stakeholders, the intervention providers, the intervention end users, and they collaborate as equal partner in the development of implementation and perhaps adaptations if those are needed to optimize interventions. 
Now, another issue, and this is uh, a, a, a pretty disturbing uh, fact, is that when I have an intervention um, uh, out, uh, a published intervention um, that is shown to be evidence-based, and then I can uh, go to my intervention provider and say, uh, look, there's a, there's an intervention that is evidence-based. Can we use that for my brother or for my child or for someone who needs intervention? It turns out that there are disagreements in the field on what the word or the phrase evidence-based means. In other words, there are disagreements on what counts as evidence. So, um, Different reviews and different um, agencies disagree on which intervention are evidence-based because they disagree on what counts as evidence. So there's, there are reviews from different agencies, the National um, Autism uh, Center, the National, um, the National Professional Development um, Networks and other agencies who create um, reviews and guidelines. Um, now, those reviews and guidelines are usually based on a critical uh, analysis of the literature where interventions are classified as being evidence-based or not evidence-based, depending on whether their effectiveness is demonstrated through a scientifically rigorous um, approach and how often this is replicated. But those criteria to establish that something is evidence-based or not are different for different scholars, for different reviews, for different agencies. For example, some agencies consider only randomized controlled trials to be the approach that is needed, that is required to um, identify an intervention as being evidence-based. Other reviews or agencies um, identify single subject designs as a legitimate source of evidence and um, to, to identify an intervention as evidence-based. So those are different approaches. Some include comparing different groups, some include comparing the same child across different conditions. Um, they all have a rationale. There's a rationale why you would do a randomized trial where children are assigned randomly to different conditions, and then you compare outcomes at the end of an intervention or a single subject design where the same person receives an intervention and then it's discontinued and then it's reintroduced so that you can see how it changes, how their uh, behavior that is targeted by intervention changes over time. But the problem is that because uh, different reviews have different ideas of what is legitimate and what is not, then practitioners rely on different baselines uh, of facts because different reviews come to different conclusions on what is evidence-based. What I call evidence-based, another colleague uh, has read on a review that is not evidence-based. And that's because this reliance on different baselines of facts, it's based uh, on the different sources that they rely on. Now, this confusion about the fact that what I call the truth or the evidence, the facts, is different from what another colleague calls uh, the evidence or the truth, uh, leads to clinicians' hesitancy to adopt new interventions despite documented effectiveness or caregivers' hesitancy to utilize interventions despite documented effectiveness. So uh, some interventions that have been shown to be evidence-based might not be adopted in the community and might not reach uh, children who will benefit from them. Um, one example uh, comes from this work by our colleagues in Texas who um, did a survey uh, on uh, to um, behavior analysts who are the primary service providers for autism in the United States. And what they found is that um, most or, or there was very little knowledge among behavior analysts on a class of intervention called naturalistic developmental behavioral interventions, uh, which, have, uh, which actually have a solid evidence base as documented by uh, randomized control trials and 
uh, or clinical trials using different uh, other approaches as well uh, that provide a solid foundation, a solid uh, documentation of evidence-based, of evidence uh, of, of effectiveness. Uh, however, few people believe that those practices were effective or appropriate, most likely because they were relying on sources um, that um, had skepticism towards randomized control trials, which are, uh, according to most scholars, according to most scholars, the most rigorous way to um, document whether an intervention is beneficial or not, although it's not perfect. Um, and in fact, um, this is what I was just saying, um, naturalistic developmental interventions, this is a meta-analysis, uh, have been shown to be as effective as the behavioral intervention that most ABA providers consider to be effective. And in fact, um, even more when um, the effect size estimation, whether the estimation of effectiveness was based on studies that used a randomized control trial uh, design. So this is again, not to, um, the, the take home message here is that depending on the research design that you're using, and uh, whether the, the specific recommendations for evidence-based intervention come from one um, agency or review or another, and depending on whether they want to consider randomized controlled trials or single subject designs or other approaches as a legitimate source of evidence and the way that attributed to these different uh, approaches that can result in different recommendations leading to different people having different um, opinions and not implementing intervention, this intervention despite the fact that they're proved to be effective. To be effective. Now there's another issue and it's the, it's the fact that different reviews and agencies, the ones who provide recommendations, the one who tell uh, service providers, this is what evidence base is, uh, they classify interventions according to different conceptual categories. Uh, for example, there are different um, criteria that people use um, on classifying an intervention as being part of ABA or as being an intervention based on applied behavior analysis. Now, because there are arbitrary inclusion or exclusion criteria, uh, in different categories of interventions. Uh, that lead again, results again, in different um, results or recommendations on the evidence-based status of different intervention by different reviews and agencies. I'll give you a quick example. This is a recent uh, systematic review and meta-analysis. Uh, it comes to um, a specific conclusion about um, the effectiveness of um, ABA-based uh, interventions or early behavioral intervention. However, if you look at the specific approaches, the specific intervention programs that were considered as early behavioral interventions, there are some interventions like this joint attention mediated learning, um, program that in other reviews are considered in a different category, mutually exclusive with early intensive behavioral interventions. For example, in this other review uh, that I showed before, that same intervention is considered to be a developmental intervention separate from behavioral intervention. So depending on what interventions we put in these different categories of intervention, we come to different conclusions on what is effective uh, because we, again, if we disagree on what is ABA, then we also disagree on conclusions on whether ABA is effective depending on the criterion that we use to classify interventions as being ABA or as being um, legitimately um, um, documented to be evidence-based depending on the design that it's used. 
Now, this is very consequential because most US states have insurance coverage, uh, have, have a, a insurance coverage mandate for autism and that a general behavioral health benefit mandate, but some mandates specifically mention ABA, right? So that means that you will receive services um, if interventions that are implemented by your service provider tick the box for being an ABA-based intervention. Now, many ABA providers are willing to incorporate new evidence-based practices, such as the early star Denver model, which is arguably based on um, ABA science and other naturalistic developmental behavioral interventions, uh, which have, uh, again, they are uh, indeed based on applied behavior analysis, but they are discouraged to do so. Um, for example, this is a, a something, a, a text from an email that I received from a colleague saying, my biggest concern is that I don't seem to be able to find out whether there is a consensus in the field about the status of ESDM. ESDM is the early star Denver model, which I mentioned before. The um, Association for uh, Professional in Behavior Analysis informed me that the organization has not taken an official position on these interventions. And so ESDM providers might get pushback from insurance companies for using this intervention. So even if it's effective, the perception that it might not be identified as being based on applied behavioral analysis leads a provider not to use it and many children will not receive it. Now, different reviews, because different reviews organize autism interventions or classify autism interventions according to different taxonomies, um, trials that support the effectiveness uh, of early star Denver model or other naturalistic developmental behavioral interventions uh, might not be used uh, to support effectiveness for ABA practice, uh, sometimes are considered to be mutually exclusive with a ABA, sometimes they're considered to be the same as ABA, and this can lead to families and provider reporting denial of receiving uh, this intervention and other interventions. And this is one example of how conceptual disagreement, disagreements on whether this intervention can be considered ABA or not, uh, has very practical consequences. Uh, for practice and policy for individuals not receiving interventions. Now there's another area where people disagree and this is again, even more complex. The goals of interventions. What are we trying to achieve when we're doing interventions? Of course, any consensus on what to do needs to be based on consensus of why we're doing it. Um, now, when I was, uh, you know, when I started my journey in the field of autism, and I was thinking about the needs uh, of my brother, of my brothers um, who have autism, the answer to that question seemed to be pretty straightforward to me. Um, they need so much assistance in their everyday life. So uh, I need an intervention that helped them being safe. Uh, that have that empower them with tools like communication, either verbal or nonverbal communication, so that they they can communicate their needs uh, and so on, um, and learning um, skills that will be important for them to attend or to to navigate the environments where they are expected to be in their communities, such as school and so on. But uh, more and more, the goals of interventions are the subject of important debate. Uh, and this leads end users to the perception that behavioral interventions, the interventions that are focused on teaching behaviors might prioritize conformity or compliance at the expense of uh, neurodiversity, a term that is being used uh, more and more to identify variations in neurological functioning that should be recognized and respected as other human variations. So the narrative here is it's okay to be different. Is your intervention trying just to change the surface of my child's behavior? 
so that they act like everybody else who doesn't have autism, but is not helping their well being, is not helping their learning. Because of this perception, um, we have again interventions that have been shown to be uh, effective that might not reach children um, because either the, 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 the families or uh, intervention providers uh, become hesitant. Maybe this intervention is actually uh, not designed in the best interest of, of, of this child because it's not uh, responsive to um, the sort of recognition for diversity that is uh, that, that we want to have. Now, the issue is, is that we lack a universal metric of successful outcome for autism intervention. So I cannot be successful if, if I don't have a clear destination, something that I wanna make sure that we all agree we should try to accomplish with the intervention. So we need more clarity on intervention goals. Uh, and as service providers, we need to be able to communicate exactly what we're trying to achieve um, so that it's clear that the intervention is designed to improve or to empower uh, children with skills that are relevant to their well being, to their safety, um, to their success in life. And to do that, we need intervention that focus on intervention targets and measure. And we need to use a language that is centered around quality of life, self reliance, well being, freedom from distress, and societal barriers to community participation. So, less, um, so that means that we really want to identify. Uh, those on the autism spectrum as individuals uh, who have um, goals, who have preferences, who are actively engaged in the learning process. This is what we're trying to do with early intervention. We try to teach behaviors, but those behaviors need to be uh, relevant for the child, uh, to the child's well-being. Not just it's not just about compliance. Now, of course, there are layers of complexity here, because it would be easy for me to say, I'm not trying to change the autism and I'm just trying to change um, the, the, the skill set of the child so that the person is empowered to have a better well-being. Now, there are some components. First of all, there are some components um, of quality of life that are different and uh, at different ages. For example, I talked before about compliance. Now compliance, doing what another person tells you to do is very important in toddlerhood. Um, and so as an adult, I can make decisions about what I want to do um, that, that are based on my history of understanding um, aspects related to, for example, safety or hygiene, but toddlers are typically being told by adult to do, you know, to wash their hands, to not eat a lot of chocolate and so on, to cross the street when the light is red and not green. So in that situations, we do want uh, interventions that are designed to facilitate compliance. It's not compliance to everything, it's compliance in response to safety, hygiene related um, important uh, skills. And we also need to um, uh, acknowledge that there is overlap between some measures of autistic symptoms and dimensions of quality of life and self-reliance, such as the ability to communicate. I do need to provide children as much as possible with tools that will help them communicating. I don't care if it's verbal communication or if it's nonverbal communication, but children who cannot communicate, they experience much more frustration and they're more likely to have a, a, a lower quality of life. So the ability to communicate or difficulties in communication are both an area of impairment of autism, a core a defining manifestation of autism and an intervention target associated with quality of life. So when I'm targeting the ability to communicate, I am both targeting an autism manifestation and uh, I am doing something that is designed to improve the quality of life of uh, individuals 
on the autism spectrum. So as you can see these different dimensions, uh, the quality of life and addressing autistic manifestations are not mutually exclusive. So it's very important until we don't have a clear agreement on what we're trying to accomplish and why, uh, we're gonna have again, interventions that are shown to be effective, but end users might not be willing or able to, to, to use them. Now, I'm gonna end with a little bit of the, the attempts that we're doing uh, to address some of these issues. So uh, this is a paper that we have published uh, recently um, together with colleagues at the UC Davis Mind Institute, including colleagues who identify themselves as neurodivergent. And what we try to do is to generate a consensus on the uh, mechanisms that we are, uh, that we legitimately want to target um, the, the specific processes that are involved in the intervention that we all agree um, are both respectful uh, to uh, the diversity and, and the uniqueness of a child. We don't want to try to change that per se, but are also empowering uh, individuals if targeted in a rigorous way. And I do not have the, uh, the, the, the time to explain this in detail, but basically in, in early intervention practices informed by this model emphasize agency, the construction of new knowledge of new skills that stem from the child's self-initiated behavior, learning through positive interactions that are built on the learner's motivation and goals, and promoting engagement in novel schemas through well calibrated variations on familiar schemas. Basically, we start from um, what the child knows how to do, enjoys and likes to do. And we try to expand that uh, uh, in, a, uh, in a way that is not an experience that is completely different from what the child already has. So for example, if the child likes dinosaurs and we want to teach math, we're not going to say all down with dinosaurs, now let's do math. We're gonna teach math using dinosaurs. And this, uh, we wanna alternate between familiar schemas or familiar behaviors, thing that the child engages with and variations and elaborations in a way that allows for an interplay between comfort. We want comfort during intervention and challenge because interventions do come uh, like any, form of education, you are challenging the child in a sense. So there is some room for frustration, but um, uh, 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 an interplay between comfort and challenge will help managing anxiety in the face of novelty and make the intervention experience an intervention that is not anxiety provoking. Finally, we're trying to um, go beyond the categorical definition of an intervention as or an approach being uh, beneficial or not, or evidence-based or not, and try to identify a little more um, what works for whom and in which context. Uh, for example, this is, a, this is a recent research that we did um, as we were trying to understand if receiving intervention uh, in a mainstream setting is better than increasing intervention in an autism specific classroom. And so we did a randomized control trial where we had children on the autism spectrum, young children receiving uh, an intervention called the Early Star Denver model in preschool classrooms that were either autism only classrooms or uh, Autism, sorry, autism specific classrooms, all children in the classroom had autism or mainstream classrooms with one or two children who had autism uh, and all of the other children who were typically developing. And we trained all teachers to implement the Early Star Denver model as an educational approach uh, for, uh, for all children. Uh, and so we were asking the question, who are the children who benefit the most from receiving their intervention in inclusive classrooms versus specialized early childhood education classrooms? Uh, and we measured their language at the end of the intervention and the degree to which they were interacting socially. And we looked at things like their social interests um, using eye tracking technology, which is a technology that allows me to tell 
uh, how much a child is uh, paying attention to social stimuli that are shown to them. And we also looked at their cognitive uh, functioning. And what we found, the long story short, um, is that um, children who had more social attention, meaning children who um, attended more to uh, social stimuli in a video, had uh, better outcomes in inclusive classrooms. Well, that was not the case for children who were in autism specific classrooms. So in particular children who attended to the person in the video for less than two seconds uh, tend to have lower outcomes. So the most likely because if you are uh, in a um, autism, uh, sorry, in a mainstream setting where your peers, your classmates are typically developing, if you are interested in what they're doing, if you pay attention to them, you have more learning opportunities. Well, the same is not true uh, for uh, those who are in a, in a autism specific setting. So if you are in a mainstream classroom and you are curious, you're interested in what other peers are doing, this seems to improve your, um, your outcomes. So this was um, my last slide. So uh, in, in, in conclusions, um, knowledge on evidence-based intervention for uh, uh, those on the autism spectrum is advancing at an unprecedented pace. This is good news. This is very exciting. However, those on the autism spectrum continue to experience health inequities. Uh, and this is not only due to gaps in knowledge. So we have stakeholders, service providers, and so on disagreeing um, on what counts as scientific evidence, on what counts as behavioral intervention, what the goals of interventions should be. Um, and these uh, conflicts impact the adoption and implementation. These are not only noise in the system. These are factors that deserve research examination um, in itself. So we need to study more all of these barriers, all of these different areas of disagreement uh, that ultimately prevent certain intervention practices to be active, to be actually used. Um, and so what we're doing at the AJ Drexel Autism Institute is to use a public health framework, meaning we don't just do clinical trials to figure, out, to figure out if something is effective, but we try to examine the factors that lead from the creation of knowledge on whether an intervention is effective to the use of that intervention in practice and contextualize the challenges and opportunities associated with autism in this broader context of gaps in knowledge, um, uh, uh, interventions that require more tests and barriers to adoption, implementation and translation into practice. Uh, I'm, I'm gonna end uh, here. Um, some of the concepts that I talked about are in this book that you see here. At the bottom, you also see my email address in case you wanna write um, to me for any reason. And now I'm gonna use the time that I have left to address some of the questions. Um, so, um, yep. So one, um, one question is what evidence-based interventions would will, will, will you recommend? So at this point, we can, uh, we, we can operate that, that basic classification between um, early intensive behavioral intervention that are exclusively um, based on applied behavior analysis, where all the practices can boil down to applied behavior analysis. There is evidence that those uh, intervention are, um, are effective. And then we have naturalistic developmental behavioral interventions. They're, they're separate from the, uh, what people would call net, the, 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 the naturalistic uh, use of um, ABA within ABA practice. They have a set of uh, practices that include both applied behavior analytic uh, procedures and practices that are based on developmental science um, and are implemented in a naturalistic way. I will not have time to uh, 
describe those in detail, but they are uh, indeed also effective. Um, and same for some naturalistic interventions that, that use naturalistic practi practices like PACT, uh, for example, uh, but they're not, do, do not include an explicit focus on applied behavior analytic intervention. So my recommendation is uh, other than the, uh, the manual that I, uh, that I shown before, um, is to uh, look at the recent reviews by Sandbank and uh, colleagues um, that you can find online. Um, and I put that in the chat. So yeah, one question is if, if autism is not merely a, a behavioral issue, uh, how uh, can we praise the impact of uh, evidence-based studies that mostly that with behavioral manifestations only? So this is an important point. Uh, of course, autism, the manifestation, the behavioral manifestations of autism are the top of the iceberg, right? What we are, what we are seeing and, and, and is, is uh, it's not the underlying processes that cause those, those symptoms. Uh, but what we can do with good educational programs, programs where children are learning behaviors such as language, um, such as social communication. When we have a young child going from not having any communication to um, using language fluently, um, there is research showing that this is changing also the underlying neural infrastructure um, for the child. This is preliminary research, but changes in, in function, like functional changes at the behavioral level uh, also change neural expertise, uh, and the neural infrastructure for expertise. So um, it, just in the way when we're learning how to drive a car, uh, we create new connections between different parts of the brain uh, that over time leads me to develop an expertise in that particular area. So the same is um, for um, um, important functions like language and, and so on. Um, so uh, I agree with, with, uh, with the, 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 the colleague who's saying that compliance and, and conformity shouldn't be uh, abused or overused, but complying with rules is part of being a member of a family and society. Yes, absolutely. So the way I was, I, I, uh, the, the, the way I want these questions to be framed is that this is a concern for people um, that perhaps is more um, evident now than it was before. So. Uh, in our clinic, when we see families, we might hear, wait, I don't want to do this intervention because maybe what you're trying to do is to um, disregard the uniqueness of my child and only focus on whether they'll do what you told them to do. And this is disrespectful. Um, and I do want to engage in that conversation. I don't want to dismiss that concern, but I also want to engage in that conversation from the perspective of what education is in general, especially for toddlers. So if we, uh, education is teaching behaviors uh, that allow a child to be um, a better self-advocate in a sense, and that also implies um, not crossing the street with a red light and not, um, engaging in behaviors uh, that will be uh, prevent this child, that will prevent this child from taking advantage or learning from circumstances where other children learn. So it's important to be aware of these of this concerns. Um, I'm going to select questions based on the degree to which they overlap with, with other questions. So some, some are very similar. Um, 
this, there are questions about how to how to convince insurance providers for pay for evidence based intervention. This is this is very complicated. There's a pipeline where you know you have early interventions being implemented, tested. You show that they're effective. The research is out. By the time that research is sort of assimilated and adopted by the decision makers who need to tick that box of yes, this was covered by my insurance. It's uh, there's not an established way to do that. There are different sources, different reviews that use different uh, criteria to establish whether this is covered or not, and this is sort of the problem um, of uh, of what we're talking about. That the pipeline between new knowledge and how this knowledge is deployed uh, for the benefit of, of those on the autism spectrum. There's a lot of barriers. There's one question about implement, implementation of fidelity. Why is it that uh, when uh, interventions are implemented in the community, sometimes they are implemented in a, in a diluted version um, and how culture and culture, cultural identity might play a part uh, in that. So, yes, it's so. Uh, first of all, I must say that there's a history of medical interventions, uh, let's say um, life saving surgeries, for example, uh, being implemented in a very rigorous way because there are consequences for the doctor if they don't. If the procedure, if the surgery has 10 steps, doctors really are trained to follow those 10 steps. And there's a there's an incentive of following those steps, steps, 10 steps, and not only five, uh, because of the perception that there will be a very negative consequence, such as um, the patient not surviving. In educational uh, behavioral intervention there's less of a history of expecting the same kind of rigor especially for uh, programs that are uh, designed for um, children with special needs and disability um, i saw that with my brothers many times i feel like the the perception there is that um, there is not the same level of accountability for those delivering the intervention to make sure that, I, that they are doing things in a very rigorous way. Um, and so I think that the, the, the history of individuals with disability being marginalized or being considered, um, I don't know, of less value perhaps, uh, maybe implicitly, maybe unconsciously plays a role in uh, uh, services and programs for children with disabilities, sometimes not having the same rigorous procedures to document accountability and rigor uh, that we have in other, in, in other fields. Uh, and then there is intersectionality, meaning that individuals coming from um, otherwise marginalized communities um, based on their racial or ethnic background or so socioeconomic status, uh, that might be even more true in those situations. Um, so it's very important that again we don't just we don't just do clinical trials to see if an intervention is effective, but we ask the question: What happens when that intervention is adopted in the community? Is it is it going to be implemented as intended for all children, for everybody? And when that's not the case, why? Uh, there's one question about whether therapies for adults with autism are also increased, where research into therapies for adults with autism are also increasing. The answer is uh, not as much as we wanted to, uh, that there, there was a rapid increase in, in, uh, in intervention research for younger individuals, but for people the age of my brothers, for example, very, very little. Um, and this is, this is uh, a big concern because the majority of individuals on the autism spectrum are not uh, toddlers.